I want to start, I want to kind of just tell a little bit of a story to sort of set the tone and um, paint a picture of what, what the heritage is, what this history is, what it came from, and some of the, the people that were involved in it. So in 1888, in November, um, there was a, a terrible hurricane that came and hit the whole East Coast. Think of Sandy, you know, and, and then some. Plus it was cold and you've got ice and snow. And uh, in a town called Hull, Massachusetts, up just outside of Boston, there's a very notorious lifesaver. His name is Joshua James. Uh, they called him Captain James. Anyone in the Coast Guard knows who he is. He's, he's probably the most famous lifesaver of uh, anyone who served. And uh, on this particular day, Sunday the 25th, um, this hurricane's coming through town. He and the rest of the crew, they went up to uh, uh, Telegraph Hill, which was kind of the high point in the city. And they went and looked out in the offing. And there were probably 10 or 15 ships out there anchored up. And they knew that by the end of the day, these ships were going to start dragging anchor and start coming to shore, um, giving them something to do and, and putting people's lives at risk. So uh, after looking out and, and kind of surveying the scene, Captain James mustered up his crew and he set out the beach watch. Um, there were people who were patrolling the beach up and down looking for shipwrecks and debris and, uh, you know, if anyone had washed ashore. And pretty, pretty quickly they came upon their first wreck um, about a half mile from the station. So the beach patrolman ran back to the station, let everybody know what was going on. Um, they got the surf boat and the beach cart out, and they came. And uh, pretty quickly, they shot a line over to the boat, and with the beach apparatus, were able to save nine people. It sounds very simple and very easy, but it was a complicated task. Um, they saved nine people. So the, the beach patrol starts out again. Um, it's starting to get dark at this point. It's, it's been kind of a long day. It's November, sunset's early. They come across the second wreck of the night, um, about an eighth of a mile down the beach from there. and. Uh, Pretty much upon surveying it, the weather has deteriorated at this point. It's gotten a lot windier, a lot stormier, and not only is the, the boat well outside of the range of shooting a line to it to save the people, but the seas are so monstrous that a surf boat is pretty much going to be impossible. So Captain James, he looks at his volunteers and he says, I'm only taking volunteers. I'm not going to command anybody to go. And of course, everybody unanimously agrees, everyone in his boat crew gets in the boat, and they manage somehow, by the grace of God, to get out offshore, get alongside this, uh, this grounded schooner pass a line and start pulling people off. And um, on the way over, there's there's so much water coming into the surf boat that there's actually two people in the crew that would have been rowing on the oars that are dedicated just to bailing all the water back out of the boat. It's, it's that rough. They're taking on that much water. But they get alongside, and the, uh, the eight people that are still alive on board that haven't literally frozen to death um, are so incapable of helping themselves that they basically they tie themselves off to ropes, throw the ropes to the, the rescue boat crew, and jump in the water just so that they can pull them in. But uh, Somehow, they manage to get all the eight people on board, and they make their inbound run to shore, which is, this is probably the most tenuous, the most uh, dangerous part of the whole rescue and the, the, the maneuver. When you have swells and surf coming off the stern of a boat, uh, it can easily just push it on its side, capsize the boat, and throw everybody in the water. So what they do is they wait for their lull. They wait for this kind of uh, relative calm period between the sets of waves. And uh, Captain James, he finds it, he, he sees what he needs to do and he tells his guys to row in. And on the, on the row in, um, a wave pushes them onto a rock and they start you know, succumbing to some damage, taking on some water. Um, they have to shift people around in the boat to keep it afloat, but they're, they're still making it in. And just as they're about 200 yards off from the beach, this monstrous wave comes up and it just dashes the boat to bits. So their boat is gone. Manage, somehow they manage to get everyone to shore. They, they wade through the surf, they crawl, they swim, they get ashore. So he's saved nine people, he's saved eight people. Those eight people with the surf boat, Surf boats destroyed, but they get them ashore. Um, the beach patrol resumes again. These these men were relentless. Um, their success, the the feats that they accomplished, had nothing to do with technology. Had nothing to do with their foul weather gear. Had nothing to do with anything but their stamina, their endurance, and their human will. Um, so they set out the beach patrol again. And um, at about three in the morning on uh, Monday, they come across the. Uh, the third schooner that's that's wrecked and offshore, and this one is also outside of the range of uh, anything they could throw, they could shoot a line to. So they know they have to get a boat, but they don't have a surf boat. So they walk four miles back up the beach to the next life saving station, borrow their surf boat. They actually row it out from the beach right there, and they row down the beach about six miles. That's how they have to kind of roundabout get there. They get on scene, they pull the people off, and uh, they're able to save seven. So we've saved nine, we've saved eight, we've saved seven, and they get the boat in and. Uh, of course, as luck would have it, a messenger arrives at this point and lets them know that nine miles down the beach, nine miles as the crow flies, there are two wrecks. So they don't give up, they keep going, they grab some more volunteers where they can, other volunteers swap out. Um, they make it down to the beach where two other life-saving stations have kind of started the process of trying to rescue them, but their lines have become fouled. It's blowing around so much that these lines have just twisted and twisted and twisted upon themselves. 
and they're ineffective. So uh, Captain James and his crew manhandle this, this beach cart, this surf boat. They get down there, nine miles. They launch it. Um, they pull five people off the first of those two wrecks. And in the time that they'd been, you know, getting the, eight, the, the nine miles down there and pulling the people off, the second wreck had drifted in close enough to shore that the crew was able to just jump off and um, make it to shore safety themselves. So we're talking about five wrecks, what they chalk up to be 29 lives saved over a process of about a day and a half. Um, and Captain James was there through the whole thing. And this is 1888. Um, this is what we wear today, dry suits, technology, sophisticated stuff to keep us safe. They were in oil skins, slickers, rubber boots, and, and cork life jackets, and that's it. Um, to kind of cap this off uh, and, and to kind of flesh out this, this uh, legend of a man, um, I think it's important to talk about the death of Joshua James. Um, it occurred in uh, 1902, and uh, in the spring of that year, there was a, a pretty big storm that came through, and in New York, uh, at a, a separate station, there was an accident where uh, all but one of a life-saving crew were killed. Um, they were rescuing a, a crew from a vessel, just like he had done. And uh, on that inbound run to the beach, the, the most perilous, tenuous part of the whole thing, the boat capsized and, and all but one were killed. And uh, news of this pretty much spread up and down the East Coast. Um, despite kind of the lack of technology, it was, it was a big, well-known event, uh, and it shocked a lot of people. But you can imagine Joshua James and his crew hearing about this, uh, it was even, even that much more um, kind of heartbreaking. Uh, as someone who works in an industry where a disaster like that occurs, um, it kind of shook him to his core. And uh, what he set out to do in the next two days when he had some, some trainable weather, some surf, and some, uh, some wind that came through is he went out to test his crew, to test himself, and to test his boat. And they went out at seven in the morning. He, he didn't mess around. He set out first thing. They went offshore and they spent a couple hours training in the surf. Everything was satisfactory. He performed stellarly. The, the boat exceeded expectations and the crew did an outstanding job. Um, they made their inbound run. They managed to uh, safely get ashore and uh, the, the, the boat was brought on shore, they put it on the cart, everything was secured. He hopped off the boat onto the sand, he turned out to the ocean, and he said, the tide is ebbing, he collapsed, and he died. Um, pretty much he had a heart attack, but the, the legend is, is outstanding. Um, it's, you know, you talk about famous last words, you talk about just uh, a, a pretty, pretty cool story and a life um, that I think completely encompasses um, what we're about to talk about, and, and really it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with an organization, it doesn't have anything to do with a boat, with a technology, with a method, uh, a rule, anything like that. It just has to do with human spirit and, uh, you know, this, this drive for um, humanity and proficiency and uh, others. So, um, what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, kind of focusing on the big picture things. There's so much history, I could talk for six hours. Um, so I'll, I'll keep a little bit briefer. We're going to talk about kind of the foreign routes. Um, believe it or not, you know, the United States isn't that old of a country. So this idea that we would organize people to save lives from shipwreck is actually uh, outside of the U.S. It's sort of a foreign idea. Uh, but once it comes to the United States, kind of going to stick here um, and then pretty much cover the, uh, that evolution a little bit and uh, leave it at about 1915. There's uh, so much after 1915 when the Life Saving Service became, uh, as Deb said, what is today's Coast Guard that it's, it, you would have to spend days getting into it. Um, but we'll talk about that, and then uh, there's also a lot of that history started right here in New Jersey, especially you know Long Beach Island, Manahawk, and the Jersey Shore. Um, and then there are a lot of local individuals with that as well, so we'll talk about some of them. And then I think uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the boats and the technology and some of the methods. Um, I think that's probably one of the most interesting things and, and probably gives the most uh, accurate sense of the drama and uh, the, the heroism and these impressive physical uh, feats that were, were taken under by uh, the lifesavers. So that's, that's kind of the game plan. Um, I'm going to go about it chronologically. If at any point anyone has any questions, feel free to just throw them out. I think it makes sense. You know, rather than hold on, on to them to the, uh, to the end, we'll just take them as they come. So with that, uh, let's talk about the early organizations. So we've got three things highlighted here. We've got the United States, we've got some, some place in Europe, and then some place in Asia. Um, what's happening in kind of this part, you know, the 1700s, 1708 right there, is uh, societies, as far as recorded history is concerned, societies are becoming concerned with uh, unnecessary loss of life. So as commerce increases, as trade increases, more people are out in the ocean, more people are also dying. It's, it's a, you know, hand-in-hand -hand relationship. And humans, just by their nature, are concerned with these things. So this is what's happening in the world. So in 1708, in China, along the Yangtze River, um, 
the first recorded organization for saving life was established. It was called the, uh, the Chungking Association for Saving Life. And their early focus was on reviving people who were drowned or apparently drowned or near dead. Um, so at that time, 1708, there wasn't CPR. There weren't these concepts of rescue breasts, this advanced medicine um, and intervention in uh, cases of apparent drownings. So they sort of set out to, to settle that and to work on education and work on developing methods. Um, but later on in about uh, 1737, they actually developed rescue stations. So they went from kind of just responding to these medical issues to actually providing a means to actively um, go about rescuing people. And this, is, this isn't a historic thing specific to that association. Um, it's just a general line drawing of what a sandpan looks like. It's kind of a, a typical cultural craft that you'd find in the Yangtze. Um, today, you'd find a lot of boats that look just like that. And in uh, the 1730s, that's kind of what was used uh, at those rescue stations, it's essentially the, the first recorded use of a boat for rescues, just for that. And while it wasn't necessarily designed specifically for rescues, um, in the history of the world, that's a pretty significant point. When we talk about how the boats have changed, which, uh, you know, that's one of my areas of interest, that's kind of, that's the beginning of it right there. Um, there was a saying I, I find kind of interesting. Um, at this time, piratism and barbarism is kind of a big thing. There's sort of this lawless sense on the seas and um, the pirates didn't touch the lifesavers because, as they said, to kill the hand that might save you is foolish. Um, sort of one of those Chinese proverbs, but it makes sense. They knew that if they robbed from these people, if they stole from them, if they interfered with them doing their jobs, then the pirates themselves, who often were rescued by the, the lifesavers, would, uh, would be doing themselves a disservice. So after China, um, things moved to England, and I, I don't know if that's necessarily a reflection of England or individuals picking things up from what was happening in China. I think more likely it was probably just an independent occurrence and an independent development. But in the late 1770s, um, there was a physician named William Hawes who uh, eventually founded what was known as the Royal Humane Society, but he had some of the similar goals. He had goals of how do we keep these people from dying when either at the beach or more often from shipwrecks, um, appear to be drowned, stop breathing, or, and you know we can't revive them. So he begins doing research into um, different methods for resuscitating people, and uh, he kind of gets a following going. He, he develops some methods that seem to work. Um, some of them, it's kind of what you're looking at right here, is uh, mimicking the physical action of breathing, so trying to like almost throw someone onto the, their stomach or throw them onto their chest so you compress their lungs and get them to kind of start breathing again. But he develops a following. He develops uh, people who get behind him, and he starts offering rewards for people who actually bring him um, people who are apparently drowned so that he can uh, go to work on them and try out his methods. Because without a test, how is he going to know uh, what works and, and what to go on in the future? So he begins doing that. And with that following, in 1774, he founds um, the Society for the Recovery of Persons Apparently Drowned. And that later becomes the Royal Humane Society. I always kind of laugh when I see that. I think of like puppies and kittens and whatnot. But humane, this human concern for loss of life. Um, and the, the Royal Humane Society, um, that's a big step in this, this whole grand evolution because what they, had, they started doing was, again, public outreach, talking about how do we save people from shipwrecks. And later, they went from kind of this education standpoint to passive strategies to even active life saving. Um, they offered awards as well, um, not only awards to, or rewards to bring in people to, to try these methods out on, but also medals, cash awards for people who were uh, conducting feats of heroism, which is a, a kind of a concept that's important to this evolution as well. In 1785, um, talking about sort of the boat aspect again, a gentleman named Lionel Lucan in uh, England developed what he called an unemergible boat. And basically what it was is a boat that was filled with air chambers and cork chambers so that in the water you could submerge it and it was so buoyant that it would, have pop, it would pop back up. And this is probably the earliest, um, again, recorded instance of uh, a boat specifically for kind of life-saving purposes um, and built in a way that uh, we can see even today, lifeboats are still built, rescue craft are still built with excessive buoyancy like that. So this is another stepping stone that we're talking about. Um, building off of that in 1790, a gentleman named uh, William Woodhave and Henry Great had built, of course they called it the original, but uh, it was a lifeboat about 30 feet long um, based on these same principles of buoyancy. And uh, while they called it a lifeboat, it really was just an open rowboat. And uh, when we talk about it later, there's a d big distinction between what are called surf boats and what are called lifeboats. So it was really just a, a heavily beefed up surf boat, but they called it the, uh, the lifeboat original. And shortly after this, 
Um, you've got local lifesavers in places like Aberdeen, Aberdeen, Scotland, um, on all the coasts of the UK, but uh, local bands of people getting together, using the technology like those, the, the surf boats and lifeboats, using local rowboats, and using this information in terms of what works with resuscitations to save lives. Um, in some cases, like in Aberdeen, Scotland, they used uh, taxes that were levied on the ships using the ports to support their cause and to buy equipment and, and fund what they needed to do. But in 1824, um, the National Institution for the Preservation of Life from Shipwrecks was formed by Sir William Hillary. And uh, that organization, just kind of like the Coast Guard, has its predecessors. This organization was the predecessor for today's Royal National Lifeboat Institution. It's uh, a volunteer rescue organization in uh, the UK that basically does all the search and rescue stuff that our US Coast Guard does. Um, still, it's a volunteer organization, and in 1824, that was kind of the catalyst for it with uh, Sir William Hillary. He was inspired particularly by shipwrecks he had seen. Um, he lived on the coast. You know, when a shipwreck happened in these small communities, it wasn't an isolated incident. Um, debris would come ashore, salvaged goods would come ashore, and a lot of times bodies would come ashore. So, uh, you know, <coughs> you talk about like a traumatic effect that it would have on the whole community. And in some of these places where it happened so often, you can kind of see how after a time it would have a significant impact on somebody. Um, and that has some later roots here in the United States. That's kind of a common theme that people see shipwrecks, they see loss of life, and it has a significant impact on them. Um, in 1854, the uh, institution he founded in 1824 became the Royal National Lifeboat Institution that remains today. So now we're going to bring it to the U.S. Um, in Boston, there's a, a tavern called the Bunch of Grapes, and it's still there today. And uh, a bunch of guys met there in 1786, and they founded what was called the Humane Society of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or later just the Massachusetts Humane Society. Um, but they had a, a bunch of different guys. It's a nice little etching of them. And they started for the same reasons as the Royal Humane Society. They started for this concern of you know, excessive, unnecessary deaths from shipwrecks. And uh, they worked as, in the same ways on education, on practicing these new techniques to get people to, to survive. Um, but later on, as they offered a w rewards for acts of heroism, um, they moved from these passive education strategies to more active, uh, active approaches. So the first passive things they did were in uh, 1787, frozen here. Um, they created huts on the beach that were equipped with basically stuff for people who, you know, landed in the middle of winter or were shipwrecked. So blankets, provisions. Um, they had wood stoves. They had some rescue equipment. So if a local band of just kind of ragtag volunteers came together, they could go to these huts. They could find what they needed to do, and they could effect a rescue. But for the most part, it was just a passive. If you happen to be shipwrecked and you happen to be in the right part of the beach. You might be able to, yeah, it's kind of a ridiculous idea, but you might be able to find some comfort and some salvation in a hut. Um, in 1807, they, they turned to more active strategies and they uh, created their first station in Cohasset, um, which had a surfboat or a lifeboat assigned to it. And when a shipwreck happened, volunteers could band together, take out the apparatus, and try and effect a rescue. Um, and the other thing, kind of finishing up this, this idea of early organizations, is in 1789, the US formed the United States Lighthouse Establishment, which basically took all these kind of discombobulated, unorganized lighthouses and aids navigation and put them under federal control, um, which is, that's sort of a preventative measure, which helped a lot. And also, with these lighthouses, oftentimes, since it was already federally established or already set up, it made sense to position um, some kind of rescue craft there, whether it be beach equipment or a surfboat or a lifeboat, um, this is kind of an early example of stations sort of spottily being distributed and, and getting started up. So we're getting into uh, the area where we've already seen things become established, basic organizations have started, but we're moving forward in time. So commerce is increasing, shipwrecks are increasing, loss of life is increasing, and shipwrecks are starting to create business. Um, like I said, you know, bodies wash ashore, well, debris washes ashore. These ships weren't just traveling empty, they were carrying very valuable goods. Um, and at this time in the, the history of the world, um, the majority of transportation in terms of big imports and exports was done via the sea, whether it be domestically coastwise transportation going up and down the coast, or internationally things coming from here to England. Um, when they landed on shore, there were a lot of valuable goods on board. and so. Um, people in the communities sometimes even made their whole livelihood off of what they could salvage. Um, and the U.S. started to see that there was a problem here, that this needs to, needed some governing. Um, out of this, ultimately, what came is the idea of someone 
in a community who was kind of in charge of organizing um, life-saving and salvage and who liaisoned with the government and insurance agencies. So this is kind of a significant thing as well. Um, what happened though was, go back one here, um, you had wreckers, so people who made their livelihoods off of the, the salvage goods. Um, they'd go out and they'd, they'd do what they could to save lives. As soon as the shipwreck came ashore, they would do everything in their power to save lives. Um, they, they didn't have any misguided interests or anything. But then they would go and they would uh, salvage the goods. And as happens you know, with insurance, people realized there was a great uh, opportunity to make some money and insurance fraud started happening in droves. Um, people realized they could take an old, you know, not very valuable craft, they could leave it empty, they could have a captain who was capable of taking it offshore, crashing it on the bar and, and himself making it to shore safely and then claiming insurance on it. Um, as much as we talk about the, the good of humanity and the, you know, the, the great human um, you know, imperatives and things that people do naturally, well, there's also this, this sort of evil tendency that, that's been with us forever. Um, so they go out and they make their money this way. Well, the insurance companies start smelling what's going on and they start realizing, well, we need somebody on the beach to actually um, look out for our interests. And that's where the idea of what they call the wreck master um, came into being. So this wreck master was created and sort of um, appointed by the local government, the states usually, and they would organize the life-saving effort at first. They'd get a ragtag crew together, make a, a volunteer effort to save lives, and then they would organize um, the salvaging mm -hmm and making sure that the contracts were carried out correctly and that there wasn't anything that smelled fishy, that everything was above board. Um, they helped with the investigation of the wrecks and that's, that's how they ensured the insurance company's best interests. So this idea of a wreck master, someone having the authority for a, a specific part of the beach um, is, a, is another big stepping stone in this, this big evolution we're talking about. Right about this time, um, a gentleman named William Augustus Newell kind of comes into the picture. Um, if anyone was driven on Route 9 south of 72, there's a, uh, a street probably within a half mile of there. It's called like Newell Boulevard or Newell Avenue. And it's named for this gentleman. Um, we'll talk about his whole life and then we'll bring it back to his, the time when he was kind of influencing the service. But to, uh, to start going here, um, he was born in 1817 in Ohio and uh, his family later moved here. In 1836, he graduated from Rutgers, so he got his degree here. It was just a bachelor's in arts. And then uh, three years later, he graduated with a medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, that's what he started doing. He started practicing medicine, which I also think is another common theme. We've seen these, uh, these organizations starting because of people dying and this, uh, this need for medical technology. So he started practicing medicine in Manahawkin, um, sort of around the same place on, on Route 9 down south. Uh, there's the Shin Funeral Home. I don't know if everyone's anyone's driven by that. That's his old home. He used to live there and practice medicine there. Um, he developed this habit, especially with his, his proximity to Long Beach Island, of walking the beach. Um, and he did that often during storms and during hurricanes. And what ended up happening was in 1839, um, in August, there was a hurricane that came through, you know, particularly stiff hurricane. And he was walking the beach uh, pretty much by Surf City, Ship Bottom, kind of this area, really basically where we are right now. And um, you couldn't see anything. Wind is blowing sand, blowing spray, there's fog, there's rain. He, he couldn't see anything, but he was walking kind of along the surf line, he's walking along, and all of a sudden he heard human screams. Um, and that alerted him to the presence of a shipwreck. So he you know, moved out as far as he could, even waited out a little bit, and realized that there was nothing he could do. At this point, Long Beach Island was not populated. There was no way for him to get volunteers together to make an effort. He had no equipment. There was nothing he could do. He's, he's alerted to this wreck by human screams, and he stood by as 13 <coughs> bodies washed ashore, the whole crew at his feet. Um, talk about you know, a meaningful impact. That probably, that horrific impact, that horrific image stuck with him his whole career and led him on for you know, almost a, a hundred year life to do everything he later accomplished. Um, he wrote after the fact about that, the idea occurred to me that these unfortunates might have been saved could a rope have been thrown to their assistance over the fatal chasm a few hundred yards to the bar and they could have been hauled through or over the surf thereby. So he realized how incapable of providing any assistance he was and he had this idea that if we could shoot a line to them or provide some way to get them from A to B, we could have done something. So this is his first idea, not the first of that idea's you know, origin in, in the world, but for him that was the first time it occurred to him. Um, and so he enters politics, um, whether that was the exact catalyst for it or it was just that's where his life was going, he entered politics. And in 1846, he was elected to Congress. Um, he served the only term with uh, a particular Illinois lawyer named Abraham Lincoln. 
Um, they became very close friends. They lived together in the, the dormitory situation, and they actually sat together in the house and uh, saw eye to eye on a lot of things and became close friends. Um, before this time, um, so that was 1846. Before this, in 1837, there was a, uh, a co congressional act that took U.S. Navy and U.S. Revenue Cutter Service vessels and basically had them patrol the coast during uh, what they called the severe portion of the season. So during the winter and during the fall when these storms are coming through to patrol and provide assistance where they could. So in 1837, there's a little bit of federal organization, but really, really not a whole lot. And then in uh, February of 1847, there was a, an appropriation of $5,000 for um, that Massachusetts organization and uh, just for their equipment. So prior to Newell kind of coming on scene, there's two small little things that had happened in the federal government to get things going. But in uh, 1848, Newell's in, in Congress, and uh, he was trying to make something happen. So he gave a speech, and uh, in January of that year, he said, to inquire whether any plan can be devised whereby dangerous navigation can be basically made safe along our shore. So he was talking about the New Jersey and the, the uh, New York coastline, all these shipwrecks, all this loss of life. Um, that was the beginning of the year, and that was his proposal. It was really unpopular and expensive. Um, the, the people in Congress and the people in the United States think with their, po their pocketbooks, it's kind of the same today. And so he needed to find a way to kind of put it in context and put it in terms they could understand. Um, so what he ended up doing was pressing every member of Congress individually, him and Lincoln, going person to person and basically pleading their case. And what he ended up doing too was citing some statistics <coughs> from uh, the past 10 years. There had been about 350 shipwrecks between um, New Jersey and New York, and 160 of those were in New Jersey. And obviously at this time, New York is a huge hub. It still is today, but at this time, it's a shipping hub, it's a coast-wise hub, it's a cultural hub. Politically, it's important. These people have constituent ties to New York. So that's what he did. He put it in terms they could understand. He stressed that these shipwrecks are affecting commerce, they're affecting the pocketbook of the nation, and they're affecting people in this, this great center. What he said was, it is the bounden duty of government, especially to protect the lives of its citizens as are engaged in those perilous pursuits from which are immediately derived the revenues of the country. So revenues are derived from shipping, people are dying, this is affecting revenues. He made people understand. And in uh, August of 1848, he attached an amendment to the Lighthouse Bill and got unanimous support for it to get $10,000 to set up this first brand new system of life saving along uh, the New Jersey shore. Um, it was set up pretty much from Sandy Hook to where we are right now, and from Sandy Hook to Little Lake Harbor, and that was all it was. It was eight stations and um, $10,000. Now, in today's day, that's, that's a lot more money, but still, at the time, $10,000 for what he was able to accomplish is, is a tiny, tiny, minuscule amount of money. Um, a year later, he was able to get another $10,000 to extend that coverage beyond Little Lake all the way down to Cape May. So by 1850 or so, New Jersey's coastline is covered um, fairly, completely, fairly well in terms of life-saving. Later on in his life, um, slavery is coming up. We're in the 1850s now, going into the 1860s. And um, this is, this is kind of to flesh out my image of who he is. I, you know, nobody knows. I haven't met him. You know, all you can do is read books. But he seems like a pretty good guy, a, a guy with some pretty solid morals. Um, and so while the issue of extending slavery was coming up and, and certainly being debated hotly, he was always against it. He saw that there was, you know, obviously a moral obligation in, in opposing that. There was a financial obligation. He actually looked at slavery as being detrimental to the economy. And um, he also thought that the issue of extending um, slavery needed to be dealt with at the federal level. It wasn't a state's right thing. But he did respect the states in the union that, you know, currently had slavery. He respected them to maintain that so that for the union's sake, things didn't fall apart. Um, Kind of on that coattail, he was reelected in 1848 to serve his second term. And uh, once that term was up, in 1850, he tried to become the governor of New Jersey. He anticipated a lot of support uh, from his life-saving legislation, which was very popular. But unfortunately, he lost in 1850 and uh, wasn't elected the, the uh, governor of New Jersey until 1856. Um, so 1856, he serves as one term. He does a lot of things like that, um, advocating for public schools. Um, he did a little bit of work small scale with the life-saving effort. Um, but mostly it was just kind of a quiet term of, as the governor. Um, and in 1864, following that, he went on to serve his final, his third term as a New Jersey congressman, um, where he kind of finished things up. In 1865, he, while he was the congressman, he actually saved Lincoln's son's life. Uh, his, his son was named Tad Lincoln. He had a bout of typhoid. 
and uh, in that sense, Lincoln kind of looked at it as like he owed him a favor, so he was always indebted to him, and he, he ended up cashing that favor in. Um, after the Civil War, there was a deserter from New Jersey. He was a young guy who had deserted to the South, and uh, Newell called in that favor. He was supposed to be executed, and he uh, had Lincoln commute a sentence. So that was kind of wrapping that things up. Um, so he's, he's supporting um, equal rights. He's against slavery. He's, he's against these things. And, and just to kind of add to that, he was all about black suffrage and extending rights to everybody. And he wrote, yes, gentlemen, suffrage is a delusion and a snare if it cannot be extended to every man created in the image and likeness of his maker. So I don't know. I just I look at him and I see another perfect example of just a, an outstanding serviceman, somebody really compassionate for human beings. Um, in 1866, he ran again for Congress, and he lost. His, his career in the uh, Atlantic coast and in New Jersey has kind of wrapped up. He's not as popular as he was. His, his ideas aren't as fresh. The things he's been able to accomplish aren't as you know, recently stuck in people's minds. Um, and he pretty much got out of uh, all politics at this point. Um, in 1866, he pushed to get pay for Lifesavers on a, like a per diem basis. So if they went out to a shipwreck, they'd get $10. And uh, that failed. So kind of a, another setback for him. Winding things down, he ran again for governor. He didn't you know, successfully win. And he goes back to practicing medicine, this time up in Allentown, New Jersey. Um, you can actually go and visit his house up there. It's right next to the Presbyterian Church today. But he was practicing medicine up there, um, doing some very uh, non-conventional, very contemporary things. He worked with skin grafts. Um, a few years before that was commonly accepted. He worked and uh, conducted procedures with anesthesia several years before that was accepted. And unfortunately, he uh, also consulted with some people that were a few years behind being accepted yet. They were what the, uh, the medical society called irregular eclectics, um, people who worked in things like herbs and uh, what we probably call today holistic medicine. Um, but at the time, in the, the age of bloodletting and things like that, were not accepted. And he actually got censured by the New Jersey Board of Medicine. And that ended things for him in a big way on the East Coast. After that, he was done. Um, in 1880, kind of riding on this. President Hayes, for whatever reason, knew of Newell. Um, I think he probably knew of some of the setbacks. And he offered him the position of being the territorial governor of Washington Territory. So 3,000 miles on the West Coast. Um, and Newell, he jumped on it. He knew that he needed to get out, start something new, and see what he could do on the other coast. Mm -hmm. So he was the governor there for four years. Um, this is a picture from 1880 when he was the governor. At this point, he's about like 60 years old, 65. Um, and that beard is nice and thick and black, and he actually dyed his beard, just a, a little fun fact about him. He was kind of vain, I guess. Um, while he was out there, you know, he's, he's advocated for suffrage for African Americans. He's been, a, you know, an, uh, very staunchly against um, extending slavery, and when he was in Washington Territory, he was an advocate for women's suffrage. And then uh, towards the end of his career, his term there, he was able to get women's suffrage granted in the, uh, the territory. There's a little bit of controversy around uh, the later part of his life. Now, you know, I, I cited some of the legislation that happened before him in terms of life saving, maybe a year or two before he got involved. But for all intents and purposes, he's, he's often called the father of the life saving service because his work and his funding really got the, the federal organization started. Um, the general superintendent of the life saving service in 76 called him the father and founder of the life saving service. Uh, but somehow in the later part of his career, that got challenged. There was a, a push to get recognition for him from both New Jersey and Washington Territory. And as soon as that was proposed, um, somebody created a stink about it. Somebody raised a question about it. And it was brought to the same superintendent of the Life Saving Service to investigate. And so he, he did this big, big, long investigation. The, uh, the proposed memorial had multiple pages of all his accomplishments and, and things and credited uh, things that had been chalked up to his, his life of service. And so he found a couple things wrong in his report that we investigated this, these claims. The first thing was that um, there had been some additional funding after Newell's time that had been associated and attributed to Newell that really wasn't his. It was kind of lumped together with his. Um, this particular report cited that he had gotten pay for Lifesavers, which he had tried to, but it, it didn't succeed. And it wasn't even a regular salary kind of pay. It was just a per diem basis. And, um, in terms of just other little small errors, there was a lot of stuff. So it kind of came out, and, and it was a big deal. It was a scandal. And what Kimball, the superintendent who investigated it, ultimately read, or read into it, and what he said himself was, and that the system he advocated, if it can be called such, bears out the slightest, if any, resemblance to the, systems, to the system of life-saving service. 
In view of the facts, it is not seen where Mr. Newell is the originator or the author of anything in the Life Saving Service, or where there are any grounds that would justify Congress in awarding to him the honor and distinction prayed for. Um, that's quite the 180 degree turn from calling him the father and founder to just about 10 years later completely redacting that. And, you know, again, I don't know the guy, I didn't shake his hand, I haven't met him, but it seems like there, there might have been some jealousy there. Um, we'll talk about Kimball later too. And he had some very, very important things that he brought about in the service, and I think it's likely that there was some jealousy, and uh, he didn't really want to share the glory with uh, what Newell had done, so perhaps that suggests some of the, uh, the controversy there. But getting to the end of his life, he's in Washington Territory in the 1880s, 1890s. He intended to live there for the rest of his life, but uh, as his family, he had a, a couple of children and his wife started dying around him. He pretty much was all alone. Um, all of his siblings except one and his wife died over a period of 10 years, and uh, the one that remained lived overseas. So he decided to move back to New Jersey and uh, back into what he had established in Allentown. Uh, unfortunately, he was pretty poor at this point. He was almost not even able to pay the rent at the, uh, the place he practiced medicine, and he ended up getting ill in 1901, and uh, by the end of the year, in August, he died and was buried in Allentown, um, which actually has a, if you get the chance, it has a nice kind of memorial to him up there and, and a family plot by his house. But uh, a few years later, there was an obituary that was found. Um, to me, if, if you're gonna cap off an individual, kind of the same way that Joshua James has some words that I think, you know, cap off his life, this is, this is it for William Newell. Um, the obituary read, Dr. Newell was the personification of grit. He began his career as a poor doctor and ended it that way. He was an excellent physician, but a poor collector of dues, and therefore he lived and died comparatively poor when he should have accumulated much wealth. There are a bunch of different cases, um, if you really look into his history, where he practiced medicine and he did some things that, working with people who had contagious diseases because he knew that they needed some dignity and some care that other people would have literally kept a distance. Um, and just case upon case where he went above and beyond and continuously just thought selflessly and acted selflessly. So that's William Newell. So 1848, we'll just kind of get back to where we were talking. 1848, William Newell does some important things for the Life Saving Service and he gets $10,000 appropriated to start things off, which is where we'll pick up back on the, uh, the timeline of life saving. <coughs> this is a painting from uh, 1868 by Edward Moran. It's called Launching the Lifeboat. And I think this is pretty much what a volunteer life saving crew would have looked like. At this point, prior to 1848, it was all just ragtag volunteers. It was the rec master who the state appointed, kind of organizing things, um, getting things going, getting a crew out. If they had a surfboat or a lifeboat, they'd get it out and they'd try and launch it. And, you know, it would kind of be a disorganized cluster. Um, but this is a, a painting that I think is pretty accurate to that. So we've got the, the federal volunteer establishment beginning. Um, we've got the rec master, we've got volunteers, we've got things growing and evolving. Um, there was an author, Dennis Armines, and he said that kind of the evolution at this point is slow, tedious, um, a reactionary legislative process which culminated not on the shores but in the floors of Congress. So with the work that William Newell was doing, it wasn't a battle of technology, it wasn't a battle of teaching people how to save lives, it was a battle of getting money and convincing people that this was a valid effort. Um, so the $10,000 that William Newell got appropriated got put into place at these eight stations. Um, it's kind of a chunk of the state, but you can see it's expanded there from Sandy Hook to Long Beach. Um, Barnegat was one, Six Mile Beach, which is Island Beach today, Squan River, <coughs> Squan Beach, which is Manuswan River, Shark River, up by Asbury Park, Deal, up by Asbury Park, and then Long Branch. Uh, these were the first eight stations, and in 1849 to 1850, they started becoming operational. Um, and the, the essential setup with them was that they'd construct this, this shed. It was about like 10 by 20 feet, cedar shake, one door. They had equipment in it. They had um, rockets, lines, uh, provisions, food, surf boats, things like that. The door was closed, it was locked, and a key was given to a local person in charge, kind of what later would be called a keeper. But there wasn't really a plan for how to maintain the gear or what to do in the event of a wreck or any kind of inspection or organization to it. This is, um, I'm not sure what time period this is from, but this is the first one. Um, the first station, number one, was Sandy Hook. And you can actually visit it today uh, across from Sandy Hook at Fort Hancock. They've moved it and pretty much replaced every individual part of it. So it's, it's kind of like it's a new thing now, but essentially a replica, essentially the first one. Um, station number one, and in May of 1849, it became active um, and equipped. At this time, too, uh, talking about kind of things becoming more organized, there was a board of underwriters that met. So with the insurance companies having their interest in, in what was going on with life saving and with wrecking, they started getting people together and uh, 
bringing all the experts in to talk about what were the best methods, what were the, bo the best boats and the best ways to save lives. And they kind of came out with two main lessons. Um, number one is they needed to develop a surf boat, like one surf boat that was built the best, it had the best design features, um, and it was standardized throughout. And the second thing was they needed to figure out a way to shoot a line consistently from shore to these ships that were stuck on the sandbars offshore. Um, and in the 18, late 1840s and 1850s, uh, up in Long Branch and Sandy Hook, they conducted some tests with basically like small cannons to, uh, to try that line throwing out. And they, they derived some results um, in terms of the surf boat debate and what they liked and what they didn't like. But for a while, uh, until really the 1900s, most of the surf boats were different when you went from one place to another. They'd be whatever the local people liked, whatever boats they were used to. Um, if you think about who made up the crews of lifesavers, it was just local fishermen. Um, actually, like all these, the pictures along the walls here of the surf fishermen and, and everything that dates back to the history of Long Beach Island and Manahawken and, and Barnegat, that's the people who, you know, the baymen, they, they developed this heritage, they developed this skill, and they were the ones who ended up going out and doing the life saving. So whatever developed locally with these design features was kind of what got embraced for at least a while. In the 1850s, there's some problems with the systems, um, or with the, the life saving system as it had basically gotten to be at that date. There were a couple wrecks uh, where either poor maintenance of the gear or just improper organization caused a lot of loss of life or at least prevented some saving of life that could have happened otherwise. Um, as I said, like those, those stations were established, they were locked, and that was it. There was no plan for how to keep that system up or to maintain it. And so that these wrecks started illustrating those problems. Um, there was a keeper in uh, New York who was like that person who was in charge of the, this individual station. And he said that uh, the principle of surf boats and station houses along our coast is an excellent one. Their present management and detail I deem bad. Government should appoint a qualified man to take charge of each boat with power in extreme cases to employ men and fairly remunerate them for services rendered. So he's already identified the, basically what needs to happen. They need to establish someone who's in charge. They need to figure out you know, how to make that happen, how to organize the, the wrecks, and they need to put that person in charge as the simple solution. Um, the two wrecks, one of them occurred here in Harvey Cedars. There was a loss of life between 200 and 300 German immigrants. Um, the bodies for weeks were drifting up between um, Pihala Park and Absecon. Um, that was a result of basically a shipwreck happening on Long Beach Island on a Sunday, the wreck master discovering it, and Sunday night the, the wreck went to pieces and everyone was killed. He wasn't able to get anyone to arrive to help people out until Monday. So there's a problem with this system. And the second one was up, um, up at Deal um, by uh, today's Asbury Park. About 150 people lost their lives there, and that was a, a lack of maintenance. The, uh, the line that they kept shooting to the boat kept parting because it hadn't been maintained. So the recommendations um, that generally came out of that was we need to appoint a keeper, we need to appoint someone that's in charge, and we need to make sure that the people who are the rec masters who are organizing and doing the life saving know what they're doing. Um, nepotism had played a big role here. If you knew somebody or you were related to somebody, you got the job. And that was the big problem, is that ineffective people who really had no business doing what they were doing, no business saving lives, mm -hmm. were in that position just because of political influence. So that was kind of how these wrecks sort of shaped the idea of what needed to change. And uh, in 1854, Congress took some action to that end. Um, they appropriated enough money to fund one keeper per station. So instead of just giving the key to someone, they said, okay, now you have the key, you're also responsible for this, so you need to maintain the gear and take care of it. Uh, and they also funded um, one superintendent for New Jersey and one for Long Island for that part of New York so that they could have oversight and inspection of all those different stations. In the late 1850s, more money's coming along. Um, there's some spotty salary pay that's happening. They kind of developed what they called the active season. So between certain months in the, the fall and certain months in the spring, that was when the active season was. So that's when they funded and paid for uh, people to be the life saving stations to conduct the rescues. And uh, they also got more money for new stations and new boats. They tried to reduce the gaps between stations and bring everything closer together so that they could more effectively uh, detect wrecks and then quicker in a, a more fast manner respond to them. The low point, I think, for this whole effort, um, you know, we've got this great idea in the 1840s. We've got money being appropriated for it. Things are getting built. Things are getting bought and uh, put into place. The low point is the Civil War um, for so many reasons. One literally from the communities, surfmen and the people who are doing the life saving are called off to war to fight and in a lot of cases being killed and not coming home. Um, from the government perspective, what's the point of spending money on this equipment that 
you know, hasn't been that effective when we've got a civil war going on and we need to fund all that, that whole process. And uh, in the context of kind of humanity and, you know, a sense of concern for things, the civil war dulled a lot of people's senses. Uh, you can imagine it's a horrific thing, the imagery, the news of it. Um, it was really dulling people's senses to the, the shipwreck issue. So a lot of stuff got forgotten about in the 1860s and equipment failed, gear wasn't taken care of, people went off to war and didn't come back. The end of the volunteer era came in the 1870s, um, actually before that. This is just like a, a basic kind of schematic, I think, that paints a picture of sort of what we have in the timeline. There's, there's no metric, there's no actual score of anything, but 1840s, the system gets pretty good, it's a good idea, and then it goes downhill till the 1860s, and then a massive increase. Um, but from the period of 1848 to 1872, these are just the basic metrics of it. They saved about 4,100 lives. The federal government appropriated almost $300,000. And if you break that down, the cost per life is about $67. Um, it's an interesting kind of statistic as we move forward in the organization. Uh, so in the 1870s, the Civil War has taught them a lot of things. It's, it showed what's wrong with how we do things. And um, at this point, um, the, the Treasury Department is looking for some guidance because there's an organization within the Treasury called the Revenue Cutter Service. Um, they're in charge of basically collecting taxes and making sure that revenue is, is being uh, tracked as it comes into the U.S. And they're in charge of the life-saving effort. They were in charge of kind of subjunctively to that. And at this point, the Revenue Service had become really mismanaged, poorly taken care of. Same things are going on with it. So the, the Treasury Secretary looked for what he called a reform-minded man, and he found it in uh, Sumner Kimball someone who could take over, be the head of the, the marine aspects of what the Treasury did, so the head of the Life Saving Service, the head of the Revenue Cutter Service. And the first thing Sumner Kimball does is he comes in, he takes things over, he becomes the general superintendent, and he sends a, a, a lieutenant out to do basically one big assessment of, of what the service needs and what it, what's wrong with it. So within two months of coming on duty, um, he gets an appropriation for almost 100 grand, and he sends this lieutenant out to find what's up with the system. So in April of that year, um, I'm sorry, it was a, a captain, Captain Fonts, Captain John Fonts comes out. He does the inspections and he comes back with his report. And largely it's critical. Um, it it's, doesn't pull any punches, it's very uh, harsh. The first thing he found was that when he went to these inspections, nobody had prepared for it. Um, today in the Coast Guard, if we know we're getting inspected, we make sure everything looks good. We know what we're doing, everything's up to snuff. And that has a dual effect, it makes sure that our drills you know, are conducted satisfactorily, but across the board, it keeps our standards up the rest of the year. So he found that a lot of these stations that he visited hadn't been doing that, which was frustrating for him. They were also too far apart. Um, the stations were just on the beach, too far apart to have successive patrols meeting halfway and you know, finding these shipwrecks as they came ashore. Um, earlier, we talked about some of the keepers and some of the crews being unfit for duty, whether it be a political appointment or they had a family member relating to nepotism so he found that a lot of the keepers were actually completely ill fit for duty they were either too old incompetent had no background in, in life saving no background in fishing and uh, the material condition of things was as he put it dilapidated filthy with but a few exceptions worthless and it gave every evidence of neglect and misuse like I said very critical no no sugar coating so um, his general constructive ideas were that the stations needed to be coordinated better, they needed to be uh, closer together. They needed a means of log keeping, um, you know, records, budgets, things like that, what was going on with their activities. He wanted to better organize the district, so organizing New Jersey into north and south and organizing Long Island into east and west. And then he wanted uh, some, some big changes with the keepers and the surfmen. Obviously the political appointments, the nepotism, that wasn't working, so he wanted people who were effective. Um, and in terms of the keepers, uh, he wrote that it needed to be someone to whom the crew can look up to, which is today that's that's still very much the case. But it, you know it was necessary at the time. Um, the other things that he needed to do was they needed to draft a standard set of regulations. There wasn't any kind of governing procedures or governing policies for how rescues were to be conducted or how drills were to be done, um, and that was one of the big things that Captain Fonts recommended to Sumner Kimball, who was the superintendent who received this report. Probably the best thing about it is that. Sumner Kimball was, was in a position to act. He was the, he was the right guy to receive the report. Um, he was a reform-minded man. He was the kind of guy who would go out and kick some butt and get what needed to be done changed or get the money appropriated for it. So his two goals were basically to convince the, his bosses that he was capable of doing that job 
and to convince them once that was established to convince them that this was a vital thing that this was necessary that life-saving was an important cause that needed to be funded and needed some attention so when he gets this report um, from Captain Fonts he does things immediately he sets a six minimum or a, a six person minimum crew so he's establishing more funding for paying surfmen in these crews so that we have a minimum number of people there um, he constructs new houses and he starts replacing the ones that were dilapidated and you know needed to work and in some cases just completely raising them just tearing them down and putting up new ones he dismissed the uh, inefficient and incompetent keepers um, I think in New Jersey there were five or six within that year that he took over that were given the boot and completely discharged because they were ill fit for service um, in the late 1870s he starts he continues on um, he's getting money from the Treasury Department he's getting more and more appropriations <coughs> but they're looking at it as basically they just keep writing in blank checks and so in 1873 they basically put their foot down and they tell him you need to provide us more documentation this isn't working um, you can't just keep telling us you need money so in 1874 he passed an act that required any shipwrecks any um, collisions fires explosions any kind of marine disaster or accident had to be reported from that point on um, kind of drawing forward to today that still goes on everything since um, 1874 has been recorded and it's provided both the Coast Guard and the Life Saving Service but also just the government outstanding statistics on you know rates of accidents and what causes them um, in 1873 building on those recommendations he also came out with the regulations for the service um, that's Captain Fonts just a little portrait of him but uh, in 1873, the regulations come out, and this is just one of the pages from them. It was a little booklet, about 45 pages long, and in the whole history of the service, it was only updated um, three times. And that speaks to one main thing, is that the stuff that contained in the, uh, the regulations was very simple. It wasn't high tech, it wasn't glamorous, it wasn't complicated or hard to understand. It was all just based on you know, the ability of these men to do this work. But the regulations came out and they dictated a couple things. They dictated like how stations needed to keep their, their logs, keep their records, maintain their finances, um, how to operate the boats. That's something we still have today in the Coast Guard. We have manuals that tell us in certain conditions, um, you know, for certain boats, these are the best practices. This is how we have to handle the boats. Um, it also came out and mandated how training need to be, needed to be conducted. In the Life Saving Service, they had every day of the week was a set day. So on Monday, they'd do a certain drill. On Tuesday, they'd do a certain drill. Saturday they do a, a complete field day cleaning of the station and on Sunday they rest and today we do the same thing we have you know in our plan of the week we have days where we do training we have days where we do maintenance so it's really alive and and well today 1873 those regulations came out 2013 a good deal of the spirit of those regulations is still absolutely in practice and, and being carried out um, the organizational structure in those regulations was also set up it looks really complicated but basically you have the Treasury Department, the Life Saving Service, and then two sides. You have a government side and a civilian side. And the government side was essentially like a military discipline kind of uh, organization. The, the Revenue Cutter Service, which maintained the taxation and um, stopped smuggling off, off the coast, they were in charge of inspecting the stations and making sure that the drills were being conducted correctly. And the civilian side was basically the operators themselves, the keepers who were like essentially like a ship captain but for the station and then the surfmen who were the, the members of the boat crews doing the work. And uh, there was you know, some back and forth uh, checking in terms of who reported to who and who did inspections with who, but it set out requirements for what each position needed in terms of age. You had to be literate, you had to be able to do math, um, things like that. And from that point on, it established this chain of command that stuck with the service forever. After uh, the organizational structure and the regulations came out in the late 1870s, just in general, this, the service is still expanding. There's stations um, up in Maine, south of Virginia being added. Uh, the Gulf is seeing stations down in Galveston, even um, Florida. The Great Lakes uh, started getting stations. And the East Coast active season, what they had said was, let's say, December to May, was expanded further. So it might have been November to June at that point. They keep expanding what, uh, what they needed people to be employed for. So at this point, this has all been volunteers. There has been some pay, but usually it was just for part time or for per rec or whatever. Um, so it's all been, I'm just gonna say all volunteer. And after 1873, um, starting in 1878, you have the US Life Saving Service and it's a federal organization on its own and it's got paid employees. Um, there was an act in 1878 that actually established 
the title U.S. Life Saving Service and set it up as its own organization and set it up as its own department um, that Sumner Kimball, that superintendent, was the officiate over. At this point in the history, um, their clientele, if you will, is still very much that coastwise transit. You know, ships going from, say, New York to the Gulf or, ship, you know, things like that. And every once in a while, you still had immigrant ships coming over from Europe. Those were kind of the most dramatic cases when you'd have ships of several hundred people coming across, going to pieces on the shoals, and then requiring uh, life-saving. But for the most part, a lot of domestic trade providing their, uh, their business. At this point, um, stations are growing, and they're starting to be categorized. So more stations are being built. They're being built closer together. And as part of those regulations, uh, in the mid-1870s, they established what each type of station was going to be. Before it had kind of been non-standard, literally in terms of architecture, you'd have a station that looked like that and a station that looked like that. You'd never had anything that was similar. But in the mid-1870s, they started formalizing what they wanted it to look like and how they were going to run and what equipment they were going to have. So the first type that they, uh, they established were what they called lifeboat stations. Um, this is from later on. This is from 1900 in uh, the state of Oregon. But lifeboat stations had big, heavy boats that didn't launch on the beach. A lot of times they would take a, a beach cart with a boat on it and launch it right into the surf. Um, most of the East Coast stations are like that. But in cases where they had deep water ports um, or they didn't have a beach accessible, um, they'd have a lifeboat station. And usually it was a bigger port, um, usually Great Lakes. Great Lakes had a lot of lifeboat stations um, and not a whole lot on the East Coast. The other concept that they had was a life-saving station. Um, a lot of East Coast stations were life-saving stations. They had the lighter surf boats that would just be powered by oars and just open boats with no, no extra buoyancy. Um, the other part that they had was the beach apparatus. And, and I'll talk all about this. Uh, it probably seems a little bit confusing. But they had the beach apparatus and the surf boats and uh, a crew that stayed on board. But usually, these life-saving stations were located near bigger cities. Or I'm sorry, located near um, at least more populated places. So the crews could easily be mustered from the community. They didn't always have to live on board, um, whereas the lifeboat stations were also a lot more remote sometimes, so the crew had to stay on board, at least when they first kind of came into being. And then the third type was what they called houses of refuge, and really the only places that had these were down in the Gulf where the water was warm. All it was was a form of those early passive huts. It was a, a house that had provisions for, um, the standard was 25 survivors for 10 days, so they had water and food and shelter. Um, but just by nature of the, the water temperatures involved, people's survival was a lot more guaranteed uh, when they ran aground or c came into trouble down south. The, the big concern then was how do they survive in effectively like a desert island kind of scenario. Um, as we get into kind of the later 1870s, 1880s, we're pretty much in the golden age of the life-saving service. The, the service has been revamped. It's hit its stride, it knows what it's doing, it's got effective, competent leadership, it's got funding, it's got good people working for it, good stations, good boats. Um, there's still a lot of people who need their assistance. It, it's really like kind of the stepping off point. There's not a whole lot of other developments that happened after the 1880s, big picture at least, in that organization. Um, really small things that happen later on, eventually they get uniforms in 1889. Um, they start experimenting with gasoline engines for their ore powered boats. Um, horses get approved to be used, things like this, really small things, but pretty much in the 1880s, that service was at its, its prime and at its optimum. One of the other things that came out of how they organized things were um, kind of standardizing the idea of the keeper and the surfman. So the keeper uh, initially was the person who they gave the key to, but later on they got a lot more responsibility and were also held quite a bit more accountable. Um, they pretty much had the authority of a, a seagoing captain over really their community, but just specifically their station. They did all the log keeping, they tracked the operations that were conducted, the training that was conducted, the finances. Um, you know, a lot of times they settled personnel issues with the crew. It was all a very tight-knit crew of about eight people. So if there was a little fight or a, a, a rumble going on, they'd break it up and make sure that morale didn't suffer because of it. Um, they were generally employed, employed year-round, um, so even while the crews sometimes were just seasonal, the keeper was always in charge and made sure that even in the off-season things were maintained. And there are some cases where shipwrecks happen in the off-season and the keeper had to deal with it. You know, shipwrecks don't just stop when we, we turn the lights off. So the keepers would go out in the community and they would go and muster up a crew and do what they could to effect a rescue even then. Um, in the late 1880s, something that pushed a lot of the keepers out of the service and got them kicked out was the uh, requirement that they pass an annual physical. 
This is kind of along the line of those little little issues that came to standardize the service. And a lot of these men were older, um, you know, not so so fit, and it, it really did whittle out kind of the last of uh, the old people who'd been appointed th at the very beginning. Surfmen were uh, the guys doing the work. Um, the keepers worked alongside of them, but the jobs were different. The keeper was very much in charge of the operations, and the surfmen were very much in charge of doing the work. Um, this is from 1905. This is Wallace Sands uh, up north of here uh, in uh, the northeast. And uh, these guys are wearing kind of, if you want to compare the mannequin right here to what they're wearing, they're wearing rain slickers, cork life jackets, the Sylwester hats, and rubber boots. And uh, things have come a long way. But surfmen were local. They were able-bodied baymen or fishermen or people who made their living off the sea. So they knew what they were doing handling boats. And that was one of the requirements. There, there wasn't a whole lot. Um, for the superintendent, for the keepers, there was a long list of things. There was an age range. There were things they had to be able to do. All these metrics and, and uh, prerequisites. For surfmen, all it said was that they were able-bodied and competent and that they lived locally. Um, every year they signed what were called articles of agreement, basically a contract every year that they had to earn. And at the end of the year, um, it wasn't guaranteed that it would be renewed. It was, it was basically based on their performance and what the, the rest of the crew thought of them. And they were also given a rank. So they were each given a number. Um, and some of the pictures of them in uniforms, you'll see on their sleeve, it has a number one through eight. Number one was the most senior guy. He was basically second in command under the keeper. And number eight and number seven were the most junior guys who, who did kind of the grunt work. Um, in uh, the period of 1876 to 1913, there was some really good data that was accumulated in the Great Lakes. And it kind of outlines um, some things just specifically about the surfman demographic and what kind of comprised that. There's sort of this idea, um, we talked about Joshua James, that he's this you know, crusty old salty guy who's served his whole life. And a lot of people look at surfmen, um, I always have myself as long standing, big long careers, doing this their whole life. When in fact, um, in this, this period in the Great Lakes, 37% of them actually left within their first year of service. And pretty much consistently what was cited across the board was meager pay. Um, throughout the service that was an issue that plagued it, whether it be pay or retirement or benefits it was always insufficient and it caused a lot of people to leave. Um, you gotta figure these people were employed locally as fishermen or later on in the tourist communities. And so when the season got expanded, it required them to spend more and more time at the stations doing their jobs. And it gave them less time in the off season to be employed on the civilian economy. So for them, it meant less <coughs> money and less opportunity to make more money. So a lot of them got out after a year. Um, but the average tour, uh, even despite a lot of those people getting out early, was about eight years. Um, the pay in 1870 was $50 a month, and then 10 years later, it went up to $60 a month. But uh, a lot of people ended up getting out early because of those same employment issues. And they're really, in the whole service, or the whole history of the service, there wasn't much that was done about that. Um, at the end, there was a little clause that was put in for uh, people who were killed in action so that their widows could get one year's pay. But that was it. For the whole service's history, there really wasn't a whole lot of support. Um, the way Congress looked at it is, it wasn't a military organization and they worked 10 months out of the year, so why do we care? That's pretty much how it was put into perspective. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. This is probably my favorite part. I think this will be the most uh, interesting and visually stimulating. We're gonna talk about the methods of uh, how we have saved lives in the past and how we do it today. Um, with, with some good pictures here. This is just a picture from uh, probably the early 1900s of uh, what was called the Breaches Buoy. Um, you can see there's a person suspended there between beach and uh, schooner. And what would happen is uh, the crew would shoot a line out to the, the ship. They'd get it up as high in the rigging as they could. They'd rig it up a certain way. And then they'd pull people back in a, a Breaches Buoy rig. We'll see a picture of it in a second here. To start things out, there was a procedure to things. It wasn't just a shipwreck happens and how do we respond. Um, the first thing that they did was they had a tower watch. And this is the Barnegat Station, um, just about a block from the Coast Guard Station today, uh, circa 1921. And you can see on the top, there's kind of what looks like a, a chimney, whatever, but it's a lookout. Um, and during the day, when it was stormy and during the night, there was always a beach lookout or a, a watch stander up there looking for ships in distress, looking for smoke, looking for flares, and they could also see on the beach where the beach patrolman was so if people were walking they could see what they were doing and they could see if they needed help the second part of that system 
uh, was the Beach Patrol. And, and we talk about the surfmen and we think that all they do is the boats, but they did the boats and they did the patrols. So they would go out and they'd walk the beach, um, sometimes four miles in one direction and four miles back. They'd usually do about a four hour patrol and then someone else would take the next patrol. Um, I've heard stories that uh, when they carried these lanterns in storms with all the sand being blown up, it would actually like literally sandblast the lens to the point where they had to be replaced on a pretty frequent basis. You can imagine like tonight, for example, going out and walking the beach um, at the surf line, wearing a rain jacket and a hat and uh, doing that for four hours, you know, let alone when it's blowing, it's raining, it's icy in the middle of a hurricane. Um, debris coming up, waves are coming up. It, it's an incredible feat, in my opinion. One of the uh, traditions that they had, and uh, we kind of preserve it in a little way today, is this uh, the surfman check. And it was a little brass tag, um, about this big, and it just had their station number on it, the district, and their surfman number. So you'd have two stations next to each other, and each beach patrol would be walking towards each other, and they'd meet essentially halfway. And we talk about this, this care for humanity, the good in humans, well, the bad in humans, the, the part that wants to slack off or take advantage of the system, would be the ones who wouldn't do their whole patrol. So in order to prevent that from happening, they had checks. So each surfman from each station would come, they'd meet halfway, exchange checks, and they'd take the checks back to the station. And in the morning, the keeper would verify that he had the correct checks from the correct stations, verifying that everyone had done their job. Um, today, we keep it alive with the surfmen who get certified today are given a, a, a surfman number and are given a check. It's a, it's a pretty cool tradition. But uh, what would end up happening, um, later on once the horses were allowed, and, and I've heard this, is that uh, they weren't actually for like riding on their patrol. They would walk with the horse next to them, and when they came across a wreck, they'd get on the horse and they'd ride back to the station. Um, the service was really big on discipline, and they didn't want people slacking off or you know sitting down on the job. They, they would walk their horse until they found a wreck, and then it would just allow them to get back to the station to get word to the rescuers of, of uh, the nature of distress. And this is pretty much what they would come upon. Um, if there was a wreck, sometimes you'd get debris, sometimes you'd get flotsam, jetsam, uh, things like that, and sometimes you'd get people that would wash ashore. Um, it's pretty grisly, and you can imagine being William Newell in the middle of a hurricane, hearing human people screaming, and having him wash up with his feet. Um, that, to me, is dramatic, and it really puts it in perspective. What they would do when they found a wreck was light off a flare. Um, there was a, a long story into kind of how this flare was developed, but it was called a Costin signal or a Costin flare, just like a road flare we have today. It would burn for a few minutes, and um, if on their patrol the surfman saw a ship that was in distress or nearing distress, they'd light one off to try and warn them to try to get them to steer away from the beach. But if they came ashore, they'd light off another one, and it would tell the vessel, we've spotted you, we're going to provide help. And then it would get back to the, uh, the lookout tower, who was looking on the beach, they'd see this flare go off and they'd know, okay, we need to start turning out the gear and getting the crew ready. This is uh, an etching of, of pretty much what that would look like. At night, it was kind of the crew's time to relax and do what they wanted. So they'd be out in the station, maybe playing games, playing cards, or uh, playing music or something, reading, and the surfman would burst through the door and say, ship ashore. And then the keeper would have a decision to make. He would decide, whether they were going to turn out the beach apparatus or turn out one of the boats. Um, it was pretty impractical to try and take both because you can see every one of the eight men is employed in carrying this beach cart as the eight men would be employed in carrying the surf boat. So it was, it was a big decision to make what they were going to do. But some of the things that kind of factored into that decision were how far is the wreck from shore? How are the sea conditions? Is it, is it too rough for us to launch a boat? Is it too windy for us to try and shoot this line? But let's say the keeper decided to turn out the beach cart. Um, this is what it looked like stowed. To me, this is this is kind of like the manifestation of the service right here. Everything is tidy, shined, polished, meticulous. Um, they didn't have all the gear that we have today in terms of every little thing we have to maintain. We have these expensive big boats. But the attention to detail and the care that they put into it is astounding to me. And I think that speaks to kind of that spirit of the service and, and why people cared about what they did. Um, this is a picture from uh, Station Atlantic City. Um, to me, it demonstrates that care and that attention to detail. They had a, a standard set of construction plans for what the boat, or the, sorry, the cart needed to be constructed of and how big it was and what it had to carry. But they had a lot of freedom in terms of how they could kind of detail it and make it their own. And these crews cared so much about how their gear looked. Um, that sense of pride is physically depicted in, in what they did to detail and name and pinstripe and everything they did to their cart. 
Um, loaded, this is what it looked like, just your generic cart. On the back, those boxes have line in them, um, the line that was actually shot to the vessels. You can kind of see this uh, circle right here is the barrel of what's called a Lyle gun. It's basically a small cannon. You can actually go up on the second deck here in the, the life-saving room and you can see there's a couple different types of, of uh, life-saving line-throwing guns. But that was used to shoot the projectile, to shoot the line out to the boat. And then there were big line reels with the hauser, the, the thick, heavy line that they used to pull people in and out. And then uh, this apparatus right here that looks kind of like a life ring on its side is the breeches buoy. Broken out on the, the ground, this is what all that equipment looked like. Um, and we talked about there being eight people in that crew. Everyone had a number. When those regulations came out, they said that number one did this, number two did this, number three did this. So the shovels right there, that was the worst job. You had to dig in the sand to put the sand anchor in. You had to dig a big hole, put the sand anchor in, and, and cover the hole back up. So number seven and number eight did that. You know, number one might just supervise or might do something less laborious. Um, but this is what everything looked like broken out. You see the date on that is 1940. So this whole procedure, this whole technology, and this method of saving lives, it continued past the 40s. I think the, the last time a breeches buoy was used was in the 50s, um, the 60s. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. By, uh, by the Coast Guard. This is what those boxes look like. Um, they're called faking boxes. That's kind of the method of how we organize line and we, we coil it up. But they would take the pins and they would weave the line throughout the pins and they'd put it in the box and then when they needed to shoot it, they'd pull the pins off and you just have this nice, neatly um, faked out bundle of line. And then on the lower left side right there, that's the projectile and it would be stuck into the, the barrel of the gun um, with that pointy end in and then the, the line was attached to the outside end and when it got shot out of the gun, it would actually flip 180 degrees and then shoot out. And early on, kind of as the technology developed, they had a lot of problems with those lines parting. Um, you can imagine physically there's a lot of heat and an explosion coming out of the gun, but there's also a lot of force. And so by engineering the weight and the, the ballistics of it, when they got it to do that flip, it created just the, the perfect um, kind of combination for shooting those lines across. And that's the breeches buoy. Um, there's also one, I think it's just over by the, uh, the office over there. It's basically a life ring with a seat of pants um, and, and some suspension on it. And then at the top, there's a pulley that travels kind of like a zip line across that, that top guide wire. Um, this is one of the crew members doing the rig. This is a pretty popular thing in the communities. Let's say that they did the breeches buoy drill on Wednesdays. Um, in the summer, vacationers would come to these vacation towns and they would actually, like a tourist attraction, come watch the lifesavers do their drills. And so in some cases, you'd have a member of the crew or you'd have the keeper's daughter or just some random person from the community would hop in and, and take it for a ride. Kind of setting things up and, and getting some perspective here, this is sort of from the beach side. This is them doing a drill and in the background uh, there's a guy standing on a pole. They call that the wreck pole. That was what they simulated the, the shipwreck would be. That would be the mast. And so they'd get the gear out. They'd start the stopwatch. Everyone would do their job and once it was all set up, they'd shoot it to the wreck pole. Um, this is just another kind of picture of the setup. Again, you can see number seven and number eight doing the crappy job. Um, they would dig, and at this end, you'd, you'd have this foundation buried. You'd have the line go up. It would be su uh, supported by uh, basically like an A-frame crotch system, and then it would be shot across. They'd take tension on it, and then it would be ready to go. It seems kind of complicated, but really there was you know, two or three main lines involved. And it was simple enough that people who were shipwrecked could receive the gear, set it up, and be rescued by it. And that's what it looked like when they fired it. Um, the, the person in charge of firing it would pull the fuse, it would shoot the gun, and that would send the first line across. And it was kind of what they called a messenger line. It was a thin line, not really heavy, and it was used to pull the heavier and then the heavier lines across. Once it was rigged up, um, you can see that's the breeches buoy. This is how simple it was. There's the top line. Um, that was like the zip line, the, the high wire that that whole apparatus went back and forth on. And then the bottom part was the in-haul and the out-haul. It was just a pulley that when they pulled one way on the beach, it would cause the breeches buoy to go out. And then when they pulled the other way, it would send it, or it would bring it back to the beach. Um, those two little dangling things are uh, instruction cards. They were printed in English and French. Um, and when that whole apparatus was shot out to the boat, they'd pull it in, they'd see what they said, and they'd rig it up how they needed to. And that's another picture of it in action. Um, it's actually a photograph. Uh, it kind of gives some perspective to photographic techniques at the time. They really heavily etched it up. You can see they, they emphasize the waves. But I think it really dramatically emphasizes what's going on. And 
you can see there's a guy climbing up the rigging um, towards the lower part. Even though a line might be shot across and help might be essentially like right on scene, ready to go, you had these people who might have been out in the environment, out in the elements for hours on hours, they still had to climb up as high as they could to get into the apparatus. So just because a line was shot across didn't guarantee that people were going to get rescued or that they'd be able to help themselves. One of my favorite things is uh, kind of the, the frugality of the government. This is what's called a hauser cutter. Um, when it was all done with the, the wreck, there was no way to easily get out to the ship to untie the lines and bring all the gear in. So they had to figure out a way to cut the lines. And rather than just leave and abandon 500 feet of line, they'd bring the breeches buoy back in, they'd put this hinged, uh, basically like fish-shaped piece of wood on the line, send it out, and when they pulled back on it, blades inside of it engaged and it cut the line. So they'd waste five or 10 feet of line instead of wasting 500 feet. You know, they, they knew that Congress wasn't gonna give them the money that they needed, so they looked at every possible way to save money and, and that's what they did. <coughs> I like this picture too. Um, we could probably recreate this picture today at Station Barnegat Light. Um, we have tow reels on the boats that we operate the same way. And just the, the way he's guiding it on with his hand, that attention to detail, every coil being successfully wrapped. Um, it, was, it was vital in the life-saving service that the mission wasn't over until everything was stowed the right way. They knew that if they didn't take care of their gear, it was going to fail them in operation. And today, 2013, we do the same thing. The other part of that is... Uh, ships still use this basic system. Um, this is a picture I took when I was on the ship I used to be on in Seattle, and we're taking on fuel from a Navy tanker, and the process is, is basically identical. Um, instead of using a cannon, they use a, a shoulder-fired rifle, but they shoot a small line across, we pull it across, it pulls a bigger line, and that finally pulls the fuel hose instead of the breeches buoy, but it comes across, and then we disconnect the whole thing and it goes back. Um, this is 2010, this technology has been used for 200 years, it's going to continue being used in the future because it's effective, it's simple, and it works. So if they didn't decide to take out the beach cart, um, let's say the boat was too far to shoot that Lyle gun and shoot the line to, the, the keeper would make the decision, we're going to turn out the surf boat or we're going to turn out the lifeboat. Um, this is a picture from uh, roughly like the Golden Gate area of California, uh, about the late 1800s. And they're doing it for a drill. but time was of the essence. You can see they're, they're all running. Um, everything was timed. It was a competitive kind of thing for them. They wanted to see how fast and how effective they could be, how quickly. So the, mo the most common means of launching was by beach. Um, this is a little more protected type of a launch, but a lot of times it was right on the open beach. Um, this is from the, the 30s, but the, um, the principles, again, are all the same. You've got the crew going out, wading into the water with this between one and 3,000 pound boat, taking it off the cart and getting it going. Um, that looks beautiful in June, but again, today the water is about 40 degrees uh, and they're going out in rubber pants and rubber boots. Once they got it off the cart, um, the first three or four guys would hop in, take to the oars, and then the last three would push on the, the stern of it and get it as far as they could until it was floating. And then they'd basically hop on in. Um, the other way that they could launch it was on a rail. This is much more like the lifeboat stations where they had deeper water. They had that marine railway system and they could easily just hop in the boat, pull a pin, and it would launch out. Um, once they got to the point where they were all on board the boat and pulling on their oars, they had to make it through the surf line. Um, if you ever ever tried paddling out in the surf, you know that it is a battle. And you can imagine taking a multi-thousand pound boat and being so vulnerable, taking water over it, filling with water, all you have is oars to try and um, overcome that. And that puts it in perspective, it's, it's kind of a, a hard photograph to really see, but that's probably a six to eight foot just plunging break, just about plunging right on top of them. Um, I don't even know how you, would, how you would overcome that, how you would power through that and have enough you know, momentum to, to make it to the other side, but that's what these lifesavers did. Every day they, they battled this um, and they made it out. Once they got past that first break, they, it was basically just to push out. Um, you can see it's not a huge wave, but the effect that that had and the amount of power and momentum they would have had to get through that is, is pretty uh, awesome in this picture. And then they get alongside. Um, in that story of Joshua James, uh, I think the, the second wreck they came on where they pulled eight people off, 
they threw a line up and they were able to just stay attached by the stern of the schooner. This is pretty much the opposite of that. They threw a line up and they got attached to the bow of the schooner. But they'd get alongside, they'd either just hold their position by rowing or they'd get the line over and then they'd bring the people on board and then head back to the beach. Sometimes the recovery was easy. Um, this is a pretty mild condition it looks like, but this again is the most tenuous, perilous part of the whole trek. Easily that wave behind them could push the boat one way or the other and just cause it to flip right on its side and the people that you tried to rescue you've now put in the water. Um, so they developed some different ways to kind of combat that. This is uh, from Cape Disappointment, Washington at the turn of the century about. Um, there's a line tending off the stern of the boat and uh, that was connected to what's called a drogue. It's, it's like a little parachute that uh, fills up once it's in the water. You can imagine if you took a bucket and held it behind you when you were water skiing, it would cause some drag, it would cause some resistance. And what that did is that prevented the boat from broaching, from exposing one quarter over the other and then capsizing. One of the other things that I, I found, uh, this is from the, the Coast Guard Historian's Office, and I, I honestly don't know what it is, but these guys are basically backing this, sur this lifeboat into the beach. Um, it's possible they have a drogue on it, but it's also possible that they would set an anchor uh, farther offshore outside of the surf line and then basically hand tend and back the boat in. This is from Cape May, and they're basically doing the same thing. You can see that line runs all the way to the beach. Um, and the guy in the boat is basically just letting out line as the surf pushes him back in. But you, it gives you an idea of kind of the obstacles they had to overcome, the waves that would have easily acted on that boat and capsized it over. Once they got in close to the beach, um, whether they used lines or a drogue or just by uh, backing on the oars, they'd get into shallow enough water. One guy would move up to the bow, um, and when it was shallow enough, he could just hop into it they'd hop over and then they had to pull the boat up. So some of these surf boats, um, again, between one and 3,000 pounds, and the lifeboats, much, much heavier than that. And you have eight guys, but still, that's a ton of, of mass that you're moving. And this is in the middle, let's say, the middle of January right now, freezing cold, and you're, blowing, you're pulling the boat up. Um, this picture is, is also hard to see. This is ice right here. So these guys just waded through frigid water in the middle of winter to pull this boat up. And that means that to pull the boat out, they had to do the same thing. They fought on the oars for a couple hours and then they brought the boat back. Um, in the late 1800s, horses were authorized and this is one of the, uh, the applications of them. Even beyond this in the early 1900s and, and to the point where they stopped using these boats, they used tractors and trucks and things like that. But uh, even with the horse, that's a steep beach. Those guys are moving 2,000 pounds of boat up the beach. So then let's talk about the boats. Um, this is a picture of a gentleman named Lonnie C. Gray. He served at Station P. Island in North Carolina. And uh, that's a whole, whole other story, but Station P. Island was actually, throughout its history, uh, basically right after it was established, manned entirely by African Americans. Um, pretty interesting progressive story, some amazing rescues that they, that they accomplished. But in the, uh, the 30s and 40s, they went and did kind of a profile of that station, and they did some pretty, pretty great portraits of the crew members. And that's who this guy is. When things started out, um, and uh, we have actually, I should say, uh, retired Navy Commander Tim Dring in uh, the audience tonight. He's pretty much the consummate boat expert for Coast Guard and Life Saving Service small boats. Probably of the people alive in the world, he's, he's one of the most knowledgeable. So he's agreed to not correct me on anything that's wrong in here. Uh, I've done my research, but sometimes it's, it's hard to tell. Anyway, um, in the early 1870s and, and before that time, the boats that the lifesavers were using were these. They were surf boats, by any other means, just row boats with uh, a square raked stern. Um, they'd been developed for surf fishing. They'd been developed to be launched and recovered on the beach. Uh, the idea behind that square and kind of backward slanted stern is that as those seas came off the stern when they were coming in, it would pick up the boat and then set it back down rather than washing the boat one way or the other. Um, before the 1870s, there was really no standardized design. It was all just whatever the lifesavers worked with, whatever they liked. And even after the 1870s, when they started kind of standardizing and building in somewhat of a uniform pattern, there still really wasn't a whole lot of uh, pattern to it. No boat was exactly like another one. This is another picture of one of the early stations that was built, um, probably around the time that Sumner Kimball started making new constructions, standardizing the architecture. But it gives you some scale to uh, about how big the boat is, you know, how many people would be in it, and how they'd house it in the, the um, station. 
This is a picture from 35, uh, 1935 at, at Coast Guard Station Barnegat Light. They were doing a survey for a new boathouse they were building. And uh, this isn't necessarily like an identical Jersey type surf boat that was used by the lifesaving service, but it was in their boat inventory at that time, um, even if it was just kind of for messing around. And uh, it's because it worked and it's because it's, it's local to this area. And it, again, it just gives you an idea of maybe from the underside, kind of another perspective of what those boats looked like. This is uh, from about 1900. Um, in that story of Joshua James, when their surf boat was destroyed and they had to travel up the beach to borrow the surf boat from the next station, um, this is what that surf boat was. It was untested. It was designed by Joshua James's brother. Uh, it was called Nantasket, but they'd never used it before. So you can imagine that story is pretty impressive on its own. You can imagine then the surf boat that they're borrowing has never been used on a case before and they just take it out and employ it. Um, Again, kind of depicting what the evolution is of boats. To talk about surf boats and lifeboats, these are surf boats. These are oar powered, double ended. Um, they're not built to be extra buoyant. They're not built to be extra heavy. They're just open row boats with two pointy ends for the most part. Um, <laughs> Commander Trink, you're gonna have to, hopefully I'm correct on this, but uh, these are basically the, the next iteration of pulling surf boats with oars. Um, Monomoy, they named them after the communities and the places they were used and designed. So Monomoy is up in New York. Um, there was a Long Branch, there was um, Race Point, all these other boats named for where they were used. The Jersey type pulling surf boat named because of New Jersey. Um, you can see that things seem a little bit more sophisticated, a little more uh, equipped. Um, there's a little more buoyancy and building up in the back of the boats. Um, they started putting the name USLSS, US Life Saving Service, on the boats, um, and you can see the carts that they were suspended on as well. This is uh, a race point type pulling surf boat um, used up in uh, Rockaway Point. Gives you again some perspective to what that whole process of rowing out was. But uh, this one was equipped with a little more buoyancy. Um, the keeper, uh, who's ro or on the sweep oar, the, the steering oar at the back, he's basically sitting on that buoyancy chamber. Um, they also had uh, kind of like a fendering system to protect the boat when they came alongside of wrecks and also to add some buoyancy to it. This is from 1923 at Townsend Inlet down by Cape May. Again, um, this really simple technology was used well into the, the uh, 20th century and uh, just shows the boat a little bit out of the water. Um, later on, two gentlemen, um, Beebe and McClellan, kind of got together. They combined forces and they started designing lifeboats and surf boats um, that were standardized and built to their specifications. Now we get into the age of motorization. Um, this is Tom's River. This was taken in 1923, but uh, a few years prior to that, about a decade earlier, the Life Saving Service started uh, kind of experimenting with gasoline engines as they sort of came to the forefront. And uh, this one used one engine and it sort of coupled the drive from the engine to two different propellers. There's one on the right side and one on the left side. Um, and it was still launched the same way though, still launched from a beach cart. But this is kind of the evolution. We've gone from primarily talking about just oars, manpower, and now we're talking about you use oars to get out to the point where it's beyond the beach and then you kick in the motor and you've got motorized power to help you get on scene faster, endure more, go farther, be more effective. In the 60s, the Coast Guard kind of decided and identified a need for even quicker small boats to get in and out of the surf zone. Um, this isn't the Life Saving Service, this is now the Coast Guard, and it's not incredibly pertinent to the Life Saving Service, but we're talking about the evolution here. So we've gone from that, that motorized surf boat from Townsend's in to this, a very maneuverable small boat to get in and out of the surf zone quickly, pull someone out of the water, and get them back to safety. This is the 30-foot uh, the surf rescue boat, which was used until um, about 2000. The, uh, the last ones were retired in Oregon, and uh, this picture was taken in the 90s. But you can kind of see just from one picture to the next how things are changing, what's staying the same, what's new. Um, consistently, you can see the boat still has a, a very high degree of uh, angle and sweep to it from a high stern to a high bow. And even though it is kind of square stern, they both still have uh, almost a rounded bow and a rounded stern. Um, and definitely ample buoyancy. The other distinction, those were all surf boats. These are lifeboats. So uh, in the 1870s, the US Life Saving Service started looking at what the newest technology was and what another rescue craft might be. Um, and so they turned to England, who had been 
kind of the forerunner in the early organizations and also was a forerunner in a lot of the boats. That's where a lot of the technology, especially with the lifeboats, comes from, is from England. Um, so in 1872, they imported this lifeboat and used it to work with, to decide what they wanted to implement with their own lifeboats, but also just to get ideas. Um, it was, it's still around. Um, this is when it was displayed at one of the stations in Northern Jersey uh, in the 30s, but uh, they started using it in 72. This is a picture from Oregon. Uh, must have been late 1890s. They were building the jetty at uh, Coquilla River, and uh, they're pulling out. I think it's a Dobbins type. I'm not really sure. But one of the things you notice right away, and you notice it with the last one, is there's something right here and something right there that the surf boats didn't have. And what that is, is it's a buoyancy chamber. It's literally just an air pocket, um, a watertight sealed compartment that keeps that thing afloat like a cork. Um, it makes it a lot heavier. They also had heavier weighted keels. But um, it was a much sturdier boat. They could withstand the most wicked surf, the most wicked storms. And for the reasons of weight and size and just having to lug those things around, at first, surfmen hated them. Um, they didn't really see the value in it. It made their jobs more difficult. They weren't proven they were this new thing. But later on, surfmen realized what that value was in, in the heavy weather performance that it was almost uh, supernatural or unnatural how well they handled. This is 1918. Um, these are guys from Coast Guard Station Barnegat. Um, this is now the U.S. Coast Guard, but it's kind of the next step in this evolution of the boats. This is uh, a 36-foot Type E, E being early was how they, uh, they typed it, and it's a motor lifeboat. So it's 36 feet, it has a gasoline engine and a propeller that powers it. It also has, you can see the, the masts with sails are kind of collapsed inward, but you could also sail or motor sail with it too. This is a picture from 1962 of Station Barnegat. Um, there's a couple different boats here, but the one that we're concerned about is this one right in the center. And it's a 36-foot TRS motor lifeboat. T was type. They just put a T for it. R was uh, revised or um, remodeled. Revised. revised. And uh, S was um, simple. I guess they'd, they'd simplified some things. Um, and. There are a bunch of different iterations of the 36. The one before, um, you can see, has a lot of similarities to that one right there. But uh, that was kind of the evolution of it. And they, they used that boat from 1937 to 1987. So a 50-year span of service. It's a wooden boat. It was built by the Coast Guard. It's, it existed and was used for 50 years. Um, and the last one was retired in 87 from a station in Oregon. This is from the mid-90s. Um, it's the 52-foot steel motor lifeboat. I've skipped a few different models and iterations here and there, but this boat was first built in 56. There were four of them built, and they serve in Washington and Oregon State. And that boat is still around today. It's, uh, as one of my supervisors called it, he called it the sacred cow. Um, it's, it's revered and very respected and loved by all the people who operate it. Um, it might only do 12 knots, but it is just a, an awesome boat that will get you through anything and always bring you back. Um, you can see though, picture to picture, there's not a lot changing. I mean, paint schemes change, sizes change, little things here or there, but the main concepts and the main features are still very much uh, consistent. This is a 44 foot motor lifeboat. It's a steel uh, lifeboat with an aluminum cabin and, and superstructure. The last one was retired in 2008 and the first one was built in the 60s. Um, the new boats that we use today are the next generation of this. So what we have today is what replaced this. But some of the, the design features, again, are very, very similar to what they have always been. And then this is what we have today. At Barnegat, we have two of these. They're the 47-foot motor lifeboat. Um, it's an aluminum boat, travels at about 25 knots, and it's self-riding. It can flip itself over. It can handle a lot of rough stuff. So some of the things that we talk about, the distinction between um, surf boat and lifeboat and what self-riding means and all these things. Um, this is today. I, I want to draw some connections between what we've seen since the mid-1800s to today, 2013. So self-bailing basically means that a lifeboat or a surf boat, if it takes on water, a wave washes over it, it can get rid of that water on its own. So this is a 47-foot motor lifeboat that we use today. And there's, um, in the, the recess on the side there, there's self-bailing ports that allow the water to exit. So 2013, self-bailing is still very much alive and well. Um, Self-riding is this concept that when a boat gets rolled over in the surf or rolled over by a wave, it'll bring itself back up. Um, in 1891, this is a lifeboat, 
and uh, the term self-riding is, is kind of ambiguous. Um, definitely the boats were built to self right They had a, a very low center of gravity with a heavy, heavy weighted keel, and they had lots of buoyancy, but it also required the crew to do some work too to help right the boat, and they needed to maneuver themselves to do that. So that's 1891, what that looks like. There's kind of two main concepts to buoyancy and, and what over time has, uh, or to, I'm sorry, to self-riding, and what over time has made that happen. Um, there's weight and there's buoyancy. If you think of uh, like a Tommy Tippy cup, a cup that will always stay stable for kids, you know, so they don't spill their cups, that's because it has a weighted bottom. It's got a low center of gravity. So this is a 44 foot motor lifeboat in the 60s, and it gets rolled over. It's going to go all the way over because it's a slow roll, it's a heavy weighted keel, it's going to go all the way. What that looks like today is a, a difference of instead of weight, it's buoyancy. Um, definitely the 47s can go all the way around. But most of the time, they, they go about 90 or 120 degrees on their side. And the, uh, the buoyancy of everything in that, buoyancy up forward, buoyancy aft, buoyancy in the cabin, and buoyancy even right here acts as like a big balloon or like a, a buoyancy air chamber. And as soon as it hits the water, it causes the boat to come back up. Um, those two kind of extremes, weight and buoyancy, have always been, in that evolution, have always been important. But you can see through time, we kind of move from just relying on a lot of weight and a watertight boat to now relying on some weight, but also definitely on buoyancy. Um, one of the other kind of design features that's always stayed with the boats is, uh, especially the lifeboats, is this concept of forward and aft buoyancy. This is from the 1990s, this is a 44, and there's a buoyancy chamber back aft, and there's a buoyancy chamber up forward, and the whole boat is watertight. And that hasn't changed since the first lifeboat was imported in 1872, and since lifeboats even before that. Um, even though it looks a little bit different, there's, there's still that concept that it's consistent. One of the things in uh, boat design, there's different terms to describe things, and uh, shear is a big one. This picture really demonstrates it to me. This is from about the 80s, but this is a 52-foot motor lifeboat. And you can see there's the point of the, the stern and the point of the bow, and there's a nice, pretty significant curve between the two. This, these lines kind of help show that. Um, Basically what that means is a high bow and a high stern. So any waves that you take on the bow and any waves that you take on the stern, it's, it's a lot easier to kind of plow up over them um, instead of having them just swamp you. And uh, that's 1980, those boats are still in service. The 47s have that. Um, the, the first surf boats and the first lifeboats have that, if not even a little more exaggerated. This is another uh, modern day, kind of a, a combination of a lifeboat and a surf boat. Um, we call it a nearshore lifeboat. It's uh, used up in Chatham because of the, the low, um, it's a very shallow river or uh, inlet and a very shallow bar, and so that's what they have to use. And even with this one, you can see, kind of drawn that line, but it shows that there's a very steep uh, angle of the bow and a very steep angle of the stern to, again, um, provide that, that wave action resistance. This is from Coos Bay in Oregon, um, another picture of the 47, and another description of, of one of those terms. We talked about shear. This is called camber, and you can see that red line shows what the deck is doing. The deck slopes, and that aids in the self-bailing. So anytime water comes up on deck, it, gravity causes it to run right off. This is 2000. Um, boats have always had that. All the surf boats, all the lifeboats that have been self-bailing have, be able to, have been able to protect themselves, have been designed that way, and this is alive today. The other thing you notice with this is uh, these. These are lifelines right here. So when we pick people up out of the water, they have something to grab onto. Um, every surf boat, pretty much, every lifeboat since they became standardized has had lifelines. So 2000, 1870, it doesn't really matter. It's still consistent. And this is a picture of a lifeboat under construction about 1910. Um, it's another one of those 36-foot motor lifeboats. And it's got everything I've just talked about. It's got those lifelines. It's got a very high bow and a very high stern. And it's really evident um, on those buoyancy chambers what that curve looks like. And those are buoyancy chambers. So now you've got the buoyancy that we've been talking about. To give a little bit more perspective to it as well, these are just a couple slides of like the schematics of what those boats were constructed like and the, uh, the, bases, the basics of them. This is a, a surf boat from 1887. It weighed about 1,300 pounds. It cost $150 to $200, depending on who it was built by and when it was built. And uh, it wasn't self-riding, and it self-bailed in about 20 seconds. So if it was filled with water, it took 20 seconds to empty that water out. This is the 44, used um, between the 60s and 2008. It was almost 40,000 pounds, 
between the start and the end of production, it costs anywhere from one hundred and fifteen to two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and it was self-bailing very rapidly, and it took about thirty seconds to self-write. And then today, what we use is the forty-seven foot motor lifeboat. When they first started making them, they cost a million dollars, and at the end of production, about one point three million. Self-writes in eight to twelve seconds, and it weighs about forty thousand pounds. So the first one was a surf boat; it wasn't a lifeboat. But just in terms of the Coast Guard and the government spending money. You can see we've gone from $150 to $1.3 million, and it even goes up from there. The last thing I want to do is just, there's, there's a couple pictures here that really show that things haven't changed. This one we saw earlier, this is the late 1800s. It's a pulling surf boat on the East Coast, breaking out through the surf. And this is a picture from the 1990s, it was 44, in bigger surf, um, farther offshore in the Pacific, doing its thing. But if you go back from one picture to the next, They don't look that different. Things have changed, the, the missions have changed a little bit, but on the whole, things have also stayed quite a bit the same. And this is that Dobbins lifeboat from Coquille River in Oregon, late 1890s. Um, they were building the jetty at that time, it's a big river inlet into the ocean. And this is 2000s at, at uh, Umpqua River, just a little bit um, to the north of that inlet. Things haven't changed a whole lot. So that's kind, of, that's kind of my message as I wrap things up here. Um, these gentlemen are from uh, the station in Coos Bay, Oregon, and uh, they're all stoic lifesavers. They all have uniforms. They all have a service. They all have a creed, um, and they all have a mission. And I feel like that heritage is like a handshake. I can't go and I can't meet William Newell. I can't meet Joshua James. But everything we do today, everything that our service does, the rules, the policies, the boats, the people, the training, everything is the same. So in that sense, I can. I can shake Joshua James' hand because at some point, Captain James taught somebody who taught somebody else, who taught somebody at a station in New Jersey, who taught somebody who I work for, who taught me. Um, it's a living heritage. Uh, if, if there's any kind of solace I can provide you as the taxpayer, you know, we do an outstanding job and we do it in the name of these guys and we do it as best we can. And uh, the practices in that spirit is very much as much alive today as it was whenever in the history of human life. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.